Another indicator are business schools. There are a few universities now, some well-known, who are starting to use the word spirituality in certain business courses. And they're typically defined as business ethics, business morals, etc. So that's another trend that's starting to show up. So the notion of spiritually based values and behaviors in the workplace has a lot to do with organizational development, organizational integrity. We can take a look at the last decade in terms of what's going on in the business world. Remember the year 2000? I think there might have been a bit of a tipping point then because it began with the dot-com blowout. Many of us in this room were involved in the dot-com industries. Many of us invested in them, and many of us lost our shirts in the process. So that was, that was an indicator. Come 2005, 6, and 7, the collapsing of the investment banking industry, other parts of the banking industry, the real estate industry, the Detroit-based automotive industries, and on and on the list goes, and we're still feeling the effect of it. One can suggest that those, those events were portenders of what was to come and maybe a wake-up. You know, the cosmos has a two-by-four and applies it regularly. And I think maybe this was one of them saying, there is a different way. What is it? You can say, well, a lot of those, those mishaps in business were based upon lack of organizational integrity, lack of a consciousness, a higher level of consciousness, lack of a connection to something greater than ourselves, however we would label it. So one reason for us to be... Uh, aware of and practice spirituality in our work has to do with the external world around us, and that is organizational integrity. A second one is conscious commerce. And the word to underscore might be fairness. Fair wages, fair trade, fair treatment of all. And that shows up uh, on uh, some bags of coffee beans as an example. Fair traded coffee. You see it on certain paper coffee cups. Fair traded. And you'll see it in other places. So spirituality in work, workplace and business also impacts fairness of how people in the work world globally are affected. Economic peace. Um, a few years ago while I was um, while I was running the Unity organization, one of the marketing people came to me for my approval for the annual Unity calendar. And typically there was a color picture on top and then the calendar for the month below. The color picture in that particular, one of the color pictures in that particular year was a, a beautiful field of wheat. And usually there was um, some kind of a quote from some author, some noted person, scripture, whatever it was. Well, the quote happened to be from a Dr. Norman Borlaug, who was a University of Iowa, University of Minnesota professor of agronomy, agriculture. And Norman's work included not only the university work, but he traveled the world teaching third world countries how to grow more and better food, and he was immensely successful at it. And in 1970, he was awarded a Nobel laureate. But the quote from Borlaug was, if you wish to cultivate the fields of peace and justice, you must also cultivate the fields of wheat, or there will be no justice, no peace. So what he meant was, if a given population doesn't have enough food, water, clothing, housing, medical care, education, community and communications, there probably won't be peace there, so we need to attend to it. One calculation suggests that if all businesses, all corporations of all sizes globally were to part with a fraction of 1% of annual operating income, operating profits, it would largely resolve many of the human issues that we see around the globe. Do remember, you've heard it before, it's still true, that 
well over 50%. I think it's more like two-thirds of the world's population lives on less than something like two or three U.S. dollars per day. Also know that 20% of the world has no clean drinking water. And yet in this country alone, we flush, and I do mean flush, six billion gallons of potentially drinkable water per day. So the idea of spirituality in our work, workplaces and businesses, also having the nature of giving to it is a key component of it. Because business, business, including us, can give to global humanitarian causes. I quoted what Buffett, Gates, and others are up to. Target Corporation, Minneapolis-based, Target Stores, was founded by a family by the name of Dayton long ago. There was a Dayton's department store, one, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And over the years, it took off and grew and exploded, and now we see it very visibly today. Ostensibly, a very successful corporation. Bruce Dayton one of the offspring of the founding family went off to India for a few years. And just being there can be transformative, and I think he was. He went back to the corporation and told the board and the executive staff that that target corporation needed to give 5% of their annual net operating profits to global humanitarian causes. Can you imagine what the board and the executive staff was thinking in a company that runs on relatively thin profit margins? But they did. And they've been doing it for years, and now they're well noted for it. 5% of their annual net operating profits to global humanitarian causes. Employees love it. The shareholders have learned to love it. And consumers, the consumers who are aware of it, love it. I know when I go into Target to buy something, some little piece of what I spend will go for some good cause. They're not the only ones. There are many. But there can be many, many more. Uh, we would expect a comment about spirituality in our lives from somebody like Gandhi. Spiritual relationship is far more precious than the physical. Physical relationship divorced from spiritual is body without soul. But would you ever dream that Henry Ford would say something like this. He's often painted as an austere, unsmiling, hardcore, rough, tough business person. Not really. Maybe, maybe his spiritual DNA still permeates that company. It was the one Detroit-based major automobile manufacturer that did not succumb to having to have our taxpayer help. And they are rising out of the near-death experience in pretty good order these days. I believe God is managing affairs and that he doesn't need any advice from me. I believe everything will work out for the best in the end, so what is there to worry about? There are a couple of spiritual principles that I'd like to share with you, one being the spiritual transaction. And that's pretty well covered in my book. It is um, founded on trust. So let's take a, an example. How many of you have ever gone out to buy something, suggest um, a new car, and you entered the dialogue and you entered the transaction, you bought the car, and you went out and you got in it and you started it up and you started to drive it home and you wished you hadn't? Anybody? Sure. Sure. Then there is also the occasion where we've gone out to purchase something as a consumer and we go into whatever place of business is providing it and we buy it and we leave with it and we are happy, we're glad we did it, we have it, we take it home, we use it and we are more than willing to go back and buy some more from that organization. We even feel it when we walk in those places of business. There's a certain energy I believe that is thrown off. We can feel it, even if there's nobody there for the moment, as we walk in. We can also feel where the energy is so-called negative. Doesn't feel so good. What is that about? 
I think it's about something called the building of spiritual transactions in those various places and the energetic offspring of those transactions. How do I create spiritual transactions in my work dealings, my business dealings? The answer is consciousness. The elevation of my consciousness, the development of my interior, the transformation of my soul, my spirit, so that I am more aware of how I'm behaving as a worker and as a consumer. Idea of a consumer. I remember going uh, late night to some airport somewhere, last flight to wherever I was going, and the flight was canceled, and I was standing facing the gate agent, who was a young woman, and I could feel the rage piling up in me. And I could see what was happening to the other passengers who were facing the same dilemma around me. And some, something happened within me that said, the rage isn't going to do it, Thomas. Do you have another choice? Well, yeah, another choice was just to stand back and sit down. The choice that became available to me in that moment, just because of my awareness, was to bless, to silently bless that agent, those passengers, that airline. And that relieved my stuff. I believe that the energy thrown off relieved other stuff. And in about 15 minutes, for reasons I do not, I guess I understand, but they were striking at the time, the agent came over to me and said, would you come and see me for a moment? I think I can get you on a different flight on another airline tonight. It's not why I did it, but that was an outcome. And I can't guarantee that outcome, of course, each and every time. But it's worth considering. M. Scott Peck, author of The Road Less Traveled, in that book suggests that Awareness is a subset of consciousness that allows me to make choices. So it is choice-making that is part of, part of this dialogue. How many of you have been involved in um, situations where you were in a work setting where you or someone else had a great idea? Yeah. And somebody said no. We can't do it, we don't have enough time, we don't have enough money, some other competitor will do it before we can, and on and on and on it goes. And we've never done it that way before, and this is the way we always do it. Knowness born out of fear. Yesness born out of faith. Run with it. Let's try it out. Let's get together and see what we can do. And there are numerous examples of products, services, and corporations that stem from that level of thinking and allowing, and accepting. One of, the, one of the great ones I'm aware of is the creation of an aircraft in the early 60s called the SR-71 Blackbird. The Defense Department had gone to Lockheed up in Burbank and said, let's build this exotic aircraft. It was not a weapon-carrying aircraft, it was surveying and reconnaissance. And Lockheed said, no, can't do it. One engineer, Kelly Johnson, said, I'll do it. Give me the money, let me handpick my people, and get me out of here. Get me off into a different building in Burbank, and we'll do it. That was a yesness born out of faith, and they did. In very short order, they created the world's highest altitude, fastest forward flying aircraft, piloted production ever. Still is, 40 plus years later. So there is an example of the acceptance and the yesness. Productivity is another result of spiritually based transactions in our workplace. Maybe you've seen the number. Somewhere between 200 and 300 billion dollars per year in the US alone of lost productivity because of job stress. If I, if I am conducting business with you, work with you, on the basis of mutual caring, trust, love, empathy, understanding, openness, etc. That, for me, relieves a lot of stress in my work. And it will for you, too, and it will for those around us. So there is another bottom line reason to have our awareness about the expression of our spiritual nature in the workplace.